It is so often a challenge for major cities, but a particular struggle for San Antonio, how to improve transportation. If you were to ask somebody, well, tell me the most important things for the success of your city, they would say economics and jobs, education, good housing, crime measures, quality of life. They might never mention transportation, but transportation is inherent in all of those things. Especially for a city expected to grow by one million more people in the next 20 years. So if you want to envision what our streets and transportation network would look like, if all that Austin traffic was in San Antonio on top of what we have today. There are plans in the works to try to keep us all moving, but not everyone is on board. Texans don't like to be forced into stuff. You know, they like choices. They like their cars. They like the independence. Getting where we need to go means so much more than just easing traffic congestion. It increases um, air quality problems that lead to uh, lung disease and cancers and heart disease. Add in a global pandemic, and now our city is being forced to look at even more possible resources to reroute the direction in which we're all headed. If we're serious about recovery, if we're serious about workforce development and economic mobility, then we have to start being serious about transportation. So what does the future of transportation look like in San Antonio? And how will that future be funded? KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. On demand, in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscasts throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano ring deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. We're continuing our conversation about transit here in San Antonio. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. This is part two of our conversation on transportation. Last episode, we talked about the history of Via Metropolitan Transit, what they do, and our city struggle to fund the agency over the years. Now we want to change gears and look at the plans to improve local transportation service and how the pandemic has derailed some of those plans. We'll start here with a transit proposition that you'll have the chance to vote on in November. KSAT City Hall reporter Garrett Berger breaks down what has turned into a long battle over an eighth of a cent sales tax. Since 2000, a one eighth of a cent sales tax has funded the protection of the Edwards Aquifer, San Antonio's primary source of drinking water, and the creation of linear creekway parks. The city's Edwards Aquifer Protection Program uses its portion of the sales tax money to buy properties and easements over the aquifer's recharge and contributing zones to block development that could hurt the aquifer. Well, the money that goes to Linear Creekway Parks pays to expand the city's greenway trail system, mainly along waterways. Voters have approved using the tax for these purposes four times so far, most recently in 2015, when they approved collecting $180 million. The city expects to reach that cap in spring of 2021, which will free up the one-eighth of a cent sales tax for other uses. Instead of renewing the tax to use for aquifer protection and linear parks, Mayor Ron Nuremberg had been pushing last year for voters to send the tax money to transit instead. It was part of the larger plan by the nonprofit Connect SA, which Nuremberg helped form to enhance transportation in San Antonio. But some argue the aquifer protection funding that's in place now is critically important and should stay right where it is. The reason that we did this Edwards Aquifer Protection Program was the car scientists told us if we kept uh, developing within the recharge and contributing areas for the Edwards Aquifer, it would most likely be a matter of time before uh, our water supply would become polluted and we would be requiring uh, pretreatment for SAW's water supply. But before anything could get nailed down, along came COVID-19, a pandemic that changed everything rearranged priorities. This is a painful but necessary decision for us. With thousands suddenly unemployed, the mayor announced the tax needed to be used for economic recovery, not transit. But VIA officials indicated they still needed that tax money. 
Ultimately, Villa and the mayor made a deal. The city would get first crack at the sales tax, used for a workforce training and education program for a few years. Then it could be turned over to transportation funding permanently. But voters are the ones who will actually decide if that will happen. Think of it as a double handoff of sorts. The current tax use is expected to expire next spring sometime. After that, the city would be able to take over that revenue stream to use for its workforce development program all the way through 2025. Then, in new year 2026, that money would be able to go towards transportation. But both of those future uses will be on this November's ballot. So, what's happening with the programs to sales tax funds now? On September 17th, the City Council approved a plan to keep funding the protection of the Edwards Aquifer, mostly by borrowing money over the course of a decade. As for trails expansion, the mayor's banking on the county picking up the tab as part of its capital program. But county officials are waiting until at least next spring when they'll have a better idea of how the pandemic has affected property tax revenues before they commit to details. Both strategies, a way to free up that sales tax revenue so voters can decide whether it will help get people back to work and later improve transportation. One of the major arguments for expanding mass transit in San Antonio is to ease traffic congestion. If more people are riding buses, that would mean fewer cars on the roads. And spending time stuck in traffic isn't just inconvenient. UTSA Assistant Professor of Urban and Regional Planning, Dr. Greg Griffin, says it's potentially dangerous. Any, you know, increase in vehicle miles traveled, you know, or a number, number of uh, the distance or hours that, that people spend in cars, uh, increases safety risk for crashes, it increases um, air quality problems that lead to uh, lung disease and cancers and heart disease. Um, and so there's a lot of hidden problems that you don't necessarily link uh, with uh, driving long distances. A study by the Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization shows that in 2019, the average San Antonio driver spent 60 hours stuck in traffic. And because San Antonio is one of the fastest growing cities in the country, that's only expected to get worse. Travel time is expected to increase 82% by the year 2040. You know, the projection was a million new people between now and 2040. If you want to env envision what our streets and transportation network would look like if all that Austin traffic was in San Antonio on top of what we have today. So if the ballot proposition passes in November, VIA will receive an additional eighth of a cent sales tax in the year 2026. But how will that additional money be used? And in general, what are the goals for the future of transportation in San Antonio? KSAT Explains producer Lexi Salazar tells us it will involve more than just adding new routes and more buses. Former mayor of San Antonio, Henry Cisneros, describes the future of transportation as a combination of investing in what currently works and innovating to ease growing congestion. Because we've been exclusively just bus, but we have to add things like enhancing via trans for the disabled, setting up a mobility on demand system where people can be picked up at their homes and brought into a stronger network of more modern buses, and then eventually uh, what they're calling advanced rapid transit. Cisneros was one of three people tapped to chair Connect SA. What's known as a bus rapid transit network is a big component in future transit plans. Transportation experts say bus rapid transit is faster, cheaper, and more flexible than a rail system. A lot of, of cities, San Antonio's size, where you have a, a vast expanse to cover and you need a fast mode to be competitive with driving, uh, BRT is a wonderful step that direction. The buses normally travel on dedicated lanes, provide fast and frequent operations, and fare collection is done off-board. VIA also wants to address a problem known as first mile, last mile. This refers to either the first or last leg of a trip, where a commuter has to travel from home to a bus stop or from a bus stop to their final destination. Some of their proposals for this problem? Expanding VIA Link, VIA's lower cost version of Uber and Lyft, partnering with third-party transportation providers, or even providing access to higher quality bus service with on-demand trips. Of course, mass transit is just one piece of the puzzle when we talk about transportation. HOV lanes are another way to relieve highway congestion. These lanes are specifically designated for cars with two or more passengers. San Antonio is getting its first HOV lane this fall on I-10 West between La Cantera Parkway and Ralph Fair Road. Other goals? At least 40 miles of dedicated micro-mobility lanes for bikes, scooters, and other modes of transportation, and constructing up to 200 miles of sidewalks. 
Those goals come with a cost, which means San Antonio will need to increase current funding options and possibly find some other sources. We need a diverse set of different funding sources to be able to, to provide the investment that VIA needs to be able to build out the system uh, that the city deserves. Here's how we currently fund transportation projects. Federal gas tax, state gas tax, sales tax, vehicle registration fees, and bond funds. Increasing the state gas tax is one option for increasing funds. It's been 20 cents per gallon since 1991. General obligation bonds are another option. They require voter approval. Other funding options include toll roads, which don't exist in San Antonio or Bear County, and vehicle miles traveled or VMT tax, which charges drivers based on how many miles they travel. Griffin says states should replace the gas tax with the VMT tax. Changing the gas tax can provide an, um, an increased revenue stream and to be able to reduce potentially the demand that we have on um, all of our federal sources. But not everyone is keen on giving more money to VIA, including District 10 City Councilman Clayton Perry. Perry says he understands the need for public transportation. He says VIA has improved its efficiency with limited funding they receive. But he struggles with directing more tax dollars to the transit agency without a clear vision. What's the plan? I've lived here in San Antonio since 1991. And um, particularly up here in my district, there's a lot of empty empty buses. I mean, when I say empty, there's nobody on. And I'm, I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with the answer is we need to just have more buses at a faster schedule to increase the ridership. That's why we don't have riders. Perry says more buses over time will also create another problem due to their weight. Yeah. It's going to increase the amount of money that is going to take to maintain and repair those streets. And as you know, we can't hardly keep up with what we have now. Perry wants to see an innovative plan from VIA that doesn't focus solely on adding more buses, stops, or dedicated lanes. One option, he says, is possibly using smaller buses that service areas where people heavily rely on public transit. He's also a fan of expanding VIA Link. Perry says buses and rail systems work better in densely packed cities. I just think this is uh, not the right environment and the right uh, layout of a city to be spending that much money on public transportation. Well, we've been talking about transportation during this episode of KSAT Explains, and we still have a lot of ground to cover, but we're going to take a quick break, shift gears here, and talk about La Nina. So in the previous episode of KSAT Explains, meteorologist Sarah Spivey showed you our seasonal outlook for the fall and winter months. The short of it, we're looking at a warmer and drier fall and winter overall, but how was that outcome determined? That's what we're going to dig into this week. So the CPC or the Climate Prediction Center is responsible for our seasonal outlooks. And a big thing they take into consideration when making those longer term climate outlooks is something called ENSO. ENSO is short for the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and it's the climate pattern over the Pacific Ocean that changes every few years. In a nutshell, it's El Nino and La Nina. And speaking of La Nina, as of August 2020, La Nina conditions were observed in the Pacific. But what exactly does that mean? Well, La Nina is expected to have an influence on our weather patterns, maybe for a few years, but definitely through the upcoming fall and winter seasons. In fact, there's about a 75% chance that we'll see an influence of La Nina through the fall and winter. This results in cool and wet weather patterns for the northern portion of the country as the polar jet stream sends storm systems through. So here's the overall big picture. We've got what we call a blocking, an area of blocking high pressure here in the Pacific Ocean that takes the polar jet stream. It starts it farther north, so that's going to make it harder for the polar jet stream to send storm systems down into the southern tier of the country. This will result in uh, rainier and snowier weather patterns, colder weather patterns as well for the northern tier of the country. Meanwhile, here in Texas, in the southern tier of the country, it's harder for the polar jet stream uh, to get down to us. So overall, our weather pattern when La Nina is in place is warmer and drier. However, just like what we mentioned last week, that doesn't mean we won't have any cool and wet weather this fall and winter. Overall, though, trending warmer and drier heading into the next several months.
While VIA looks to voters to give them access to more funding, we've been wondering about a huge VIA facility on the north side, the Stone Oak Park and Ride at Stone Oak Parkway and Highway 281. If you've traveled through that area, you have seen it with 400 parking spaces and a giant now open sign hanging from the top. It's hard to miss, but you don't see lines of cars coming in or out. So we went to VIA with questions about how that location is being used and what's the ultimate goal. The expansion of Highway 281 north of Loop 1604 is a growing pain that so many San Antonio drivers are enduring. The Via Park and Ride at Stone Oak will eventually tie into that project. Buses pick up riders who park at the garage. It will go over the southbound lanes and then it will drop into the center lanes, which is where the high occupancy vehicle service would be. And then on the return, obviously, it would ramp up from the center lane over the southbound lanes again and into the transit center. It's a direct connector. The park and ride opened in 2018, but when you pass by looking for any passengers who actually park and ride, you don't see many. These days, COVID has a lot to do with that. But prior to the pandemic, looks or at least a speedy glance while driving down the highway were apparently deceiving. According to VIA, buses carried passengers 275,000 times from that facility from June 2018 to February 2020. And VIA says that's not just people who live in the area. A third of the people that rode that service before had incomes below poverty level. And so clearly they were more likely going to Stone Oak for a, for a work, for a job, and not necessarily from Stone Oak to get into town. And of course, I don't. I think that's a wonderful thing. People can, can get employment, and that's why that will be a mobility hub and tied to mobility on demand, which will give them a lot more convenient access to all the employment opportunities. So for, from an employer's perspective, their, their employment market greatly opens. It cost $20.6 million to build the garage. VIA says 80% of that money came from federal or state grants. It cost the transit agency $4.5 million to buy the land. If making taking advantage of 80% outside funding and being ready in advance is the wrong thing to do, then I will confess that I did something wrong, but I don't think it's wrong. Arndt says building the garage was proactive, being ready for when the new HOV lanes along the revamped 281 open. Before COVID, buses ran two routes from the Stone Oak Park and Ride, one to downtown San Antonio and one to the medical center. With that facility at Stone Oak in that area, it seems that there hasn't been a lot of buy-in for mass transit. So has VIA done any studies or has any indication that once that's available and the transition from that park and ride to 281 is easier, people in the Stone Oak area will actually use it. Certainly, and most of that is based upon experience in similar markets, in similar circumstances, right? And so again, the Houston experience, which is people that live in the woodlands or people that live in Kingwood or Sugarland or Katy, these much like Stone Oak, right? communities that are not comprised of what we would consider transit rider and that when those kinds of investments that gave a, a travel time and reliability benefit to use of high occupancy vehicles were present the demand just mushrooms the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our way of life, and that includes how many people are on the road every single day. A lot of people working from home right now, and they will be for a while. But how will that affect the future of transportation in San Antonio? RJ Marquez takes a look at whether there will be any long-lasting implications. When the pandemic hit, San Antonio, along with other major cities, saw a significant drop in cars and trucks on the streets and highways. The virus had done in a three week time period what generations of planners and decision makers had never been able to succeed in doing, and that was uh, eliminate traffic congestion. The Alamo area MPO has been tracking the amount of vehicles on our roads. By late March, there was essentially no rush hour anymore. Um, which was pretty incredible to see. And we haven't, quote, recovered. In April, San Antonio drivers were on the roads about half of the time they were during the same time last year. By June, we were back to um, about three quarters of what you would see 
uh, we dipped again in July. Many of us have been able to work from home, but it's not an option for everybody, especially in a lot of industries that make up San Antonio's economy. People who have a food industry job or a service industry job, a healthcare job, there are essential people who, uh, who, who need a transportation network to get them to work even in the middle of a global pandemic. While the pandemic has taken cars off the roads, it has not stopped major transportation projects in San Antonio that have been in the works for years. Plans to expand Loop 1604 on the north side and I-35 going to Austin have not stopped, but some San Antonians are thinking about different ways to get around. This summer, there was a surge of bicyclists on the trails in the Mission Reach area along the San Antonio River. More than 65,000 people use that in May. Um, which is about half, or sorry, about two times as many as had used it the May before. San Antonio leaders say they are making efforts to become a more equitable city. Any future projects funded by the Alamo Area MPO or other agencies will have that in mind. There are about 10% of households in San Antonio that do not have a car. If you want to choose to bike or use a bus, walk or telecommute, uh, you need the infrastructure to, to make that possible. We're looking for ways that can connect people to as many destinations and improve the safety of that connection. As we've talked about, before this pandemic hit, the plan was to divert an eight cent sales tax currently funding aquifer protection to fund public transportation. But that plan, like so many others, was upended. In November, voters will have to vote on two propositions, with the goal being to first use that money for workforce development and then VIA. But many people we talked to for this episode of KSAT Explains view the issues of workforce development and transit as interconnected. Workforce development intersects with so many other issues. David Zamayello is the executive director of Project Quest, a local job training and workforce development nonprofit. I think what makes San Antonio maybe a little different is we've struggled historically with social and economic segregation. And we've been, uh, we've had an economy that's been built uh, primarily around the hospitality and tourism industry. And those industries are two of the hardest hit by this pandemic. Some of the jobs that have been lost aren't coming back. It's why workforce development has been named necessary to our city's economic recovery. But transit is another key component of getting people to work. The more sophisticated your transportation systems are, it, it creates opportunities for people to, to go to different uh, training programs and opportunities, also employment opportunities. SA 2020 has been tracking the goals our community has set for improving mobility and transportation over the past several years. The nonprofit's president and CEO, Molly Cox, says consistently success indicators for transportation have flatlined or moved in the wrong direction. If we're serious about recovery, if we're serious about workforce development and economic mobility, then we have to start being serious about transportation. Former San Antonio mayor and Connect SA tri-chair Henry Cisneros says more and more experts are realizing the link between jobs and transportation. If you were to ask somebody, well, tell me the most important things for the success of your city, they would say economics and jobs, education, good housing, crime measures, uh, quality of life, they might never mention transportation, but transportation is inherent in all of those things. It's how people get to work. It's how people get to school. It's how people get to their medical appointments. At the most basic level, investing in transit and investing in workforce development are both investments that seek to do the same thing. It's about infrastructure. Infrastructure helps people. And I think that all these different pieces do fit together. In two episodes of KSAT Explains, we have talked about the history, the challenges, and the future of mass transit. We've also talked about why a reliable public transportation network is crucial for those without other ways to get around. But before we go, we want to explain how mass transit affects everyone, even those who have never caught a ride on a VIA bus. Thanks for watching this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. We'll see you next week. If I don't use public transportation, why would I fund it, right? Like that seems to be the consistent conversation that we're hearing. Um, if I have a car, what do I need to care about alternative transit use for? Experts who study and research that very topic say expanding mass transit options will help level the playing field for people in our city who can't afford to own their own car. I think of transportation as a like a fundamental part 
of our, um, our equitable, compassionate approach um, uh, to, to the city. The city's proposition to use a portion of sales tax to fund education and job training is meant to be a helping hand for those left jobless by the pandemic. But actually getting to that training could still be a barrier. Won't do us any good to have the best education programs for work if we can't get people without cars, those who need it the most, to the jobs that benefit all of us. And even if you don't use mass transit, you likely rely on someone who does. 60% of the riders during the very beginning of the pandemic were going to work. Where were they going? Everything was shut down. And it's like clearly they were going to places that were essential, right? The places that we got our groceries from or we were taking out to go orders from, right? The places where we, hospitals, the places where we deemed essential. Investing in transit could ease traffic congestion and lead to San Antonio drivers having to spend less time on the road each day. That's something that could save money. SA 2020 data shows that if everyone in San Antonio drove one mile less per day, San Antonio's metro region would see yearly driving expenses decrease by $453 million. That doesn't say to me that we're taking resources from one place and giving them to another. It says to me that we're about to uplift an entire community. If COVID-19 has taught us nothing, it's that our health and our success and our um, well-being is just as intrinsically linked to our neighbors as theirs is to ours, right? Um, we, we have a responsibility to our community.